Hello and welcome to this Community Writing Center workshop. The Community Writing Center provides individual writing consultations and writing workshops for all writers in the Great Lakes Bay region free of charge. To learn more about our services, including virtual and face-to-face -face feedback on your writing, upcoming writing workshops, and our various writing contests and events, please visit our website at communitywritingcenter.com. This online workshop series was sponsored by funding from the Bay Area Community Foundation and the SVSU Center for Community Writing. Hi, I'm Kelly Fitzpatrick, a Michigan-based author and educator, and it is my pleasure to present to you the first session in our memoir writing series, which will focus on an introduction to memoir. Thank you so much for joining us, and let's get started. Welcome to our workshop on crafting memoir. The purpose of this workshop is to learn about the genre of memoir writing and some approaches to exploring topic. This workshop is appropriate for beginning and experienced writers alike, and it will last approximately 90 minutes. For materials, you'll need a notebook and a writing utensil. All of our workshops aim to create an inclusive, respectful, and productive environment for all writers. We aim to provide feedback, strategies, and resources writers need to improve their writing, and to encourage collaboration between writers through active conversation and participation. Here's a preview of the workshop so you have an idea of what to expect. We'll open with, uh, we're actually going to do two quick writes today and a discussion. Then we'll move on to a craft talk about the genre of memoir and the elements of memoir. And then we'll look at a couple of mentor texts with some guided practice of analyzing them. And then you'll have some writing prompts and extended writing time. And then uh, some analysis and sharing and takeaways for applying these techniques to your own writing. So let's start with our opening quick write. And we're going to do two of them today. So for the first one, I'd like you to choose one or more of the following prompts to write about. And uh, we'll write about this for about five minutes, so it will be enough time for you to kind of uh, dig into whatever the, the question is here and to really explore it. So the first one says, describe a time when you felt truly grown up and independent. What is your earliest childhood memory? Who do you wish you could see again? Or what is the most random or meaningful thing that has happened to you this week? Now, whichever one you choose, go ahead and just kind of uh, go with wherever the question leads you. And if you still have time left after you feel like you've kind of exhausted uh, what, what's coming to you on that one, feel free to jump to a different bullet point and flesh that one out a little bit. And then we'll come back at the end of the time and uh, I'll ask you one more question, and then we'll do a little bit of digging on our quick writes before we move on to the craft talk.
You have about 30 seconds remaining. Okay, hopefully you were able to get some things written down for that first quick write. Now for the second one, I'd like to give you a quote. Um, in the preface of Mary Carr's book, The Art of Memoir, which is a well-known craft text on this topic, she says, I once heard Don DeLio quip that a fiction writer starts with meaning and then manufactures events to represent it. A memoirist starts with events then derives meaning from them. In this manner, memoir purports to grow organically from lived experience. So thinking about that quote, um, I'd like you to answer this question. What is the meaning of your life experiences you would like to share with others through your writing? Now, uh, asking you what the meaning of life is, is maybe a, a very large question, but here we're really trying to get you to uh, reflect and drill down on what are some of the messages and themes uh, that you would like readers to take away from the memoir writing that you would like to do. So what, are, what is the meaning um, that you want your readers to pull uh, from your stories? So just take a couple minutes here and just jot down uh, what comes to mind if you want to make a map uh, or if you want to just make a bullet list, uh, whatever feels uh, most natural.
You have about 30 seconds of writing time remaining. All right, now that you've had a chance to do some writing, uh, we're gonna take a minute and do some discussion. So I'm going to preview the instructions for you, then we'll look at an example response together, and then you can go back and answer these questions for your own piece. So the questions that we're looking at are, after you go back and read it, which parts do you love or find interesting that you want to explore more? Now, chances are what you were able to write during the quick write period is not a finished, polished uh, draft, and that's totally okay. But what are some of the uh, little interesting spots that you think you're maybe on to something that you might want to come back to? So highlight or underline those. And then how did you choose which details to include? So regardless of which prompt you chose, uh, it all required going back and reflecting on different moments in your life. How did you go about deciding uh, which details from your memory to actually record and put down on the paper. And that's going to become relevant later on when we talk about um, incorporating detail into a memoir. And then finally, is there a theme or larger meaning rising to the surface? So that second quick write, I kind of asked you to brainstorm what you think uh, some of the important meaning is that you would like to convey in your writing. And then I'm curious... Uh, if you see any of those hints of that meaning uh, showing up in the first quick write you did, that's totally okay if not. Uh, but start looking for patterns in the writing that you do because then that's something you can, you can play on later. So this is kind of the type of, of analysis we're looking at here. So here is a uh, example response that I wrote to the prompt question about what's the most like random meaningful thing that's happened to you in the last week. Uh, and mine uh, occurred at a farmer's market. So uh, here, here's my response, it's, it's two screens long and then we'll just answer the questions really quickly. Those are beautiful, I say. The grower at the farmer's market stand can't hear me through my mask, so I have to repeat myself louder, pointing to gorgeously striped eggplant of all shapes and sizes. They're Sicilian variety, he says proudly. Excellent, grilled. I want to buy one, but I'm afraid to. Eggplant has always baffled me. Whenever I try to cook it, the result is soggy, bitter styrofoam that took a whole afternoon. So instead, I ask him for a bundle of carrots. As I'm stepping away, he holds out a small baseball-shaped eggplant. Want to try one? On me? I long gave up trying to master the art of aubergines, assuming that it's just a thing in my box of cants, like rollerblading and spelling the word Q. But now this random grower hands me one of the most adorable little veggie gems I've ever seen, and suddenly the thing I can't do is let it go to waste. I smile and thank him. When I get home, I take a picture of the grenade-shaped produce so I can remember how beautiful it was before I probably ruin it and pull out my George Foreman. That counts as a grill, right? I wash the eggplant and slice it, and it starts turning brown immediately. Is that supposed to happen? Oh well, no turning back now. Okay, so there's my little uh, interesting escapade in veggie buying. So I just marked uh, the, the parts that I love that are here in this, in this rough draft, and then what I see coming through as a potential theme or potential threads of meaning that I might be able to build on if I were to continue this piece. So uh, one of the parts I love is the detail about soggy bitter styrofoam, which is a taste sensory detail. And I find it very difficult to incorporate taste as a sense um, often. And so this, I was happy that I came up with a detail for that. And then as a theme, there's this idea of like being afraid to branch out and try something new. Um, 
you know, especially if, if it's, there's a potential that it's gonna go wrong. So that theme is kind of showing up here in the pink on the first slide, and then on the second one, um, it gets reinforced. So a thing in my box of can'ts, meaning things that I tried to do and, and could not master. Um, and then down below that gets echoed with, with before I uh, probably ruin it, which I didn't do. Um, for those who are concerned, uh, the eggplant survived and it was actually pretty good. <laughs> Um, but I also love uh, the detail about rollerblading and spelling the word Q, which I had to look up just to get it right on the slide. <laughs> and I like the phrase, the most adorable little veg veggie gems. So I don't know if I'll continue to develop this into you know, a longer memoir piece, but um, this is a relatively everyday thing, just buying a, a vegetable, right? Um, but it can be used as a lens to... Uh, examine this larger theme about being able to accomplish something uh, in life. Okay, so go ahead and uh, do that same thing, just quick analysis uh, on, your, on your piece. And with this last question here, you can also incorporate uh, some of what you wrote down as far as potential themes or larger questions that are showing up in your writing. All right, now we are at our craft talk, which is where we're gonna talk a little bit about this genre and how to write in it. So the memoir genre is a type of nonfiction writing, meaning it is the author's retelling of true events in their life and the impact those events had on them personally. Typically, a memoir recounts a particular moment or event in a person's life, or focuses on one aspect of a person's life. Uh, I kind of think of it like it's a slice of someone's life. So um, it's not their whole life story, but it's one aspect of it. It is a genre that relies heavily on memory and on recounting events in both a responsible and personal way. Okay, let's break this down a little bit further. This is a graphic that just attempts to show the interconnectedness of uh, some of these different nonfiction genres. So uh, the larger oval here is labeled creative nonfiction, and this is going to be uh, any sort of nonfiction that is narrative based uh, and that focuses on like elements of style as part of its uh, structure and its telling. And then here are three types of creative nonfiction. 
and I have them overlapping slightly because they do sometimes, uh, they, they can sometimes overlap. So uh, memoir is the one we're, f we're focusing on for this workshop series. And uh, uh, as, as stated on the previous slide, memoir is a, uh, a retelling of a specific event or an aspect of someone's life um, so that it's both factual but also a creative representation of the meaning that the author took from, from that experience. A personal essay is uh, similar, but it's usually much more topical. It's kind of focused around the topic first, and then it, it draws on personal experience to support that. Whereas memoir is uh, trying to capture lightning in a bottle, <laughs> so to speak, and to, to really pull down uh, those experiences onto paper. Uh, and then an autobiography is a someone's complete life story that they have written that really attempts to capture uh, all or, or at least a variety of elements of their life. So all uh, interrelated here and, you know, uh, someone else might draw this chart slightly differently and that's totally okay. Um, but they're, uh, these are all types of writing about true events. So a quick note on facts versus meaning. Facts are observable, verifiable events that either happened or didn't. So there was a family picnic or there was not a family picnic uh, on, you know, on this date. You want to try to keep facts as accurate as possible in your memoir writing. Now, sometimes you might not be able to uh, remember and uh, no one else was there or you can't find it in research. Um, in that case, do your best. Um, but you want to tell the, the story in such a way that um, someone else who was there would say, yes, that is what happened. Um, so, you, so you do want to have your facts straight. However, meaning is different. It is what we take away from an event and how we formulate understanding. So that means that two people could be at the same family picnic and each take away a different meaning from the experience based on the interactions they had, based on the impact it had on them, based on their perception of things. Um, this one is very subjective and it's going to vary from person to person, but it also makes for, th this is part of what makes memoir so unique is because it's your life experiences, but told through your unique point of view and your perspective with your worldview and, and, uh, all of the things that you have lived through, those are going to influence how you tell the story and, and make it very much your voice. So uh, memoir can be written about any experience, but two great places to start to sort of mine some potential memoir material are watershed moments and everyday life. So let's look briefly at what those categories mean. Watershed moments are moments in your life that are significant or life-changing in some way. Some people might call some of these milestones. Um, these might include, but are not limited to, career or job changes, relationship moments, marriage, divorce, births and deaths, dealing with illness, relocating or travel, and shifts in belief, worldview, or self-concept. So when we think about the events that sort of punctuate our lives, uh, that that's going to be these these watershed moments. Um, and these can be really great places to start because they tend to have a lot of conflict surrounding them, sometimes sometimes good conflict, um, sometimes tension. and uh, there's there's change happening here in all of these things. And change often can be a really great place to create narrative. The flip side of that is everyday life. So uh, you can also create memoir around what seems like a mundane encounter, but that 
uh, has meaning there for you to find. So the facts of the situation might not seem that significant, but if, but if you dig below the surface, and a great example of this is in Annie Dillard's Living Like Weasels. And it's, an, it's a story about how she was walking um, just out in, in a park somewhere and encounters a weasel and they stare into each other's eyes for a moment. And it's kind of a, a revelatory, beautiful, wild um just moment where where she just had an encounter with nature. So here's some examples of things that might happen to you on a daily basis that that might make good memoirs. Encounters with strangers, uh, encounters with nature, interesting objects, something that went wrong, (laughs) which uh, we've all had happen to us, and finding meaning in something small. So this really can take all sorts of forms, uh, but since uh, our lives are comprised of lots of little moments strung together, oftentimes um, there's meaning in these small things. And a lot of times these can serve as great symbols or metaphors for deeper themes that you want to talk about. Okay, um, let's touch on some elements of memoir. And you're going to recognize some of these from the Fiction Workshop series if you were with us for that. Uh, but they're used in slightly different ways than memoir. So as a narrative form, memoir can employ all kinds of stylistic devices, but the following are some common and helpful ones uh, specifically for memoir. So the first one we've kind of already touched on, and that's theme. Uh, So what is the message inherent in this story? This is that meaning that we've been talking about. Why are you telling the story? What is there uh, in this experience? that you want the audience to walk away with. And then sensory detail we touched on during the fiction workshop. And this is description that uses the five senses to evoke a sense of realness or a sense of place um, to make something, to, to help the reader feel like they really are there with you experiencing this event. Most uh, good memoir is going to incorporate this. There are There are some styles that do not use this, uh, but generally speaking, this is a great way to help the reader immerse themselves in your memory. Dialogue is optional. Uh, If there's conversation that's going on between different people, uh, obviously dialogue is going going to come up and it can really help the reader to follow along with with what's uh, happening in that scene. And I just want to make a note here that um, no one expects you to remember all lines of dialogue verbatim exactly as they were said. That's usually not how memory works. <laughs> um, you want to, to, again, stay true to the facts as much as you can. So Uh, If you don't remember exactly what they said, um, come as close as you can, um, again, so that at least the spirit of the thing is there, um, that someone else who was there can say, yeah, that's what we talked about. That's that's pretty much what was said. Um, And then another optional piece you can play with is a flashback, which is jumping from one point in your life to another. You can actually flash back or flash forward. And the benefit to this is that it sometimes can help you show contrast or growth. Um, so if I was uh, to write a memoir about teaching and I was then to uh, flash back to, let's say, my student teaching experience or maybe um, a fieldwork experience in college, something earlier, that would allow me to kind of sh- uh, show and explore that growth at different points in my career. So um, these are not mandatory, and there's a, a huge uh, long list of other things that you can play with in memoir, but these are a good sort of starter kit <laughs> for, for what to include. Okay, let's look at a short excerpt here from an example memoir, and uh, this one incorporates these first two things here really, really well. So um, it has a theme. And that's very strong, and also some some pretty vivid sensory detail. So this is an excerpt from Apple Gifts, 
which is from Pulling Down the Barn by Anne-Marie Ullman. So I'm going to read this. Um, this is not the complete story. It's, it's just a little chunk of it. But I want you to look for the, the theme and um, sensory detail. This room, the big attic at the east end of the second floor in the worn old farmhouse, possesses two uncurtained dormer windows that face north like wide open but half blind eyes. Though they invite light, it comes in sideways the way we learn. The room smells of wood, quilts, trunks, mothballs, and the oily scent of old army uniforms. But most of all, it smells like the apples we store there from October to March, individually wrapped in sheets of newspaper and stacked neatly in the bushel crates, tucked into the coolest corner away from light. If you unwrap one, apple air floats into your face. The room is old and dark. Yet unwrapping an apple here is like opening a flower or a present. So if we just take a look at what we have going on here, um, even though this is just the first paragraph of the story, we still already have a theme that's showing up and it's highlighted here in pink. Uh, it comes in sideways the way we learn. So we know we're going to be getting a piece that's going to discuss the learning process and, and how a person goes through that. There's also so much sensory detail here. Um, I probably could highlight almost the whole paragraph, but I just highlighted some of the, some of the best bits here. The apple air floats into your face. That's one of my favorite ones. Uh, the windows like wide open, but half blind eyes. Again, this that comes back to that meaning here. So right out of the gate, this story is establishing um, a theme and also a very vivid place for us to exist, to uh, envision this environment that the author experienced. So uh, I wanna give you a couple of things to keep in mind uh, you don't have to begin at the beginning or tell your story in chronological order. You can leave out irrelevant scenes and events. So you don't necessarily have to tell everything. Uh, if you had a conversation at home and then you drove somewhere and then something else important happened, you can leave out the drive uh, if you want to. Remember, a memoir is just one story from your life, not the whole thing. The goal is to make that one story as meaningful and vivid as possible. So don't get uh, too bogged down in feeling like you have to explain everything or tell everything that was important. A lot of times, watershed moments in our lives are going to have uh, significance and bearing on several different aspects of our lives, and you don't necessarily have to explain all of them in in a memoir piece, you can just focus on one dimension of meaning, so to speak. You do not have to explicitly state the theme or the meaning. Often having it be implied is stronger. Again, there are exceptions to, to all of these things. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to come right out and state it, but a lot of times subtlety is your friend. Okay, let's look at a longer example together and analyze it. As we read the following short memoir by David Sedaris, look for the following. And you can either jot these down or if you just want to uh, take a picture of the screen with your phone, whatever is going to work for you to kind of keep these things in, in your mind or they might be already familiar based on what we've done with the workshop so far. What is the watershed event he is describing? And how did it affect him? What is the overall theme or message of this piece? How does he use sensory detail to help us relive his memories with him? Where does he place dialogue? What additional dialogue do you think was said that he left out? And there's a flashback within the memoir. How does it inform the story? Now, uh, the story that we're going to look at together is uh, called The Youth in Asia 
by David Sedaris. And it, the whole story takes up six slides. Um, so just so you have an idea um, how long the piece is, it's a little bit on the longer side, but I wanted you to see uh, a complete arc here. Now this story is part of a larger work, um, but it's a, it's a subsection uh, of a larger narrative that has its own little arc. So I'm going to read it and let you kind of watch for those things and then we'll just kind of talk about briefly afterward what we found. During the final years of Magin II and the first half of the Molina Epoch, I lived with a female cat named Neil who'd been abandoned by a scary alcoholic with long fingernails and a large collection of kimonos. He was a hateful man and after he moved, the cat was taken in and renamed by my sister Gretchen who later passed the animal on to me. My mother looked after the cat when I moved from Morale, and she flew her to Chicago once I'd found a place and settled in. I'd taken the cheapest apartment I could find, and it showed. Though they were nice, my new neighbors could see no connection between their personal habits and the armies of pets, pests aggressively occupying the building. Neil caught 14 mice, and scores of others escaped with missing limbs and tails. In Raleigh, she'd just lain around the house doing nothing, but now she had a real job to do. Her interest broadened, and she listened intently to the radio, captivated by the political and financial stories that failed to interest me. One more word about the Iran-Contra hearings, and you'll be sleeping next door with the aliens, I'd say, though we both knew that I didn't really mean it. Neil was old when she moved to Chicago, and then she got older. The Oliver North testimony now behind her, she started leaving teeth in her bowl and developed the sort of breath that could remove paint. She stopped cleaning herself, and I took to bathing her in the sink. When she was soaking wet, I could see just how thin and brittle she really was. Her kidneys shrank to the size of raisins, and while I wanted what was best for her, I naturally assumed the vet was joking when he suggested dialysis. In addition to being old, toothless, and incontinent, it seemed that for the cost of a few thousand dollars, she could also spend three days a week hooked up to a machine. Sounds awfully tempting, I said. Just give us a few days to think it over. I took her for a second opinion. Vet number two tested her blood and phoned me a few days later, suggesting I consider euthanasia. I hadn't heard that word since childhood, and immediately recalled a mismatched pair of Japanese schoolboys standing alone in a deserted schoolyard. One of the boys, grossly obese, was attempting to climb the flagpole that towered high above him. Silhouetted against the darkening sky, he hoisted himself a few feet off the ground and clung there, trembling and out of breath. I can't do it, he said. This is too hard for me. His friend, a gaunt and serious boy named Komatsu, stood below him, offering encouragement. Oh, but you can't do it. You must, he said. It is required. This was a scene I had long forgotten, and thinking of it made me unbearably sad. The boys were characters from Fatty and Skinny, a Japanese movie regularly presented on the CBS Children's Film Festival, a weekly TV series hosted by two puppets and a very patient woman who pretended to laugh at their jokes. My sister and I watched the program every Saturday afternoon, our gas bag of a collie imposing frequent intermissions. Having shimmied a few more inches up the pole, Fatty lost his grip and fell down. As he brushed himself off, Skinny ran down the mountain toward the fragile, papery house he shared with his family. This had been Fatty's last chance to prove himself. He thought his friend's patience was unlimited, but now he knew that he was wrong. Komatsu, he yelled. Komatsu, please give me one more chance. The doctor's voice called me back from the Japanese schoolyard. So, the euthanasia she said. Are you giving it some thought? Yes, I said. As a matter of fact, I am. In the end, I returned to the animal hospital and had her put to sleep. When the vet injected the sodium pentobarbital, Neil fluttered her eyes, assumed a nap position, and died. My then boyfriend stayed to make arrangements, and I ran outside to blubber beside the parked and unfortunately locked car. Neil had gotten into the car believing she would live to experience the return trip, and that tore me up. Someone had finally been naive enough to trust me, and I'd rewarded her with death. Racked by guilt, the youth in Asia sat at their desks and wept bitter tears. 
A week after putting her to sleep, I received Neil's ashes in a forest grain can. She had never expressed any great interest in the outdoors, so I scattered her remains on the carpet and then vacuumed them up. The cat's death struck me as the end of an era, the end of my safe college life, the last of my thirty-inch waist, my faltering relationship with my first real boyfriend. I cried for it all and spent the next several months wondering why so few songs were written about cats. My mother sent a consoling letter along with a check to cover the cost of the cremation. In the lower left corner, on the line marked memo, she'd written, Pet Burning. I had it coming. And that is the end of that section. So let's talk really uh, briefly here. Um, what is the watershed event he is describing? Obviously, this is about the death of a pet. So he had to have his cat put down. And how did it affect him? Um, he states this pretty clearly, that he feels like it's the end of an era. It's a transition period for him uh, where it's almost kind of a, like a growing up point uh, where he has to mature uh, out of this experience. What's the overall theme or message of the piece? Um, this one you can interpret several ways, um, but I would probably say it, it is um, along the lines of cats can be really good friends, um, but losing a pet can be more devastating uh, than one would expect, since he kind of talks about it lightheartedly in the beginning. Um, but also you could maybe say um, the overall theme here has you know, uh, like an existential feel to it in the sense that he, this death is causing him to sort of rethink um, where he's at in his life. How does he use sensory detail to help us relive um, his memories? Uh, There's several uh, places in here, uh, like the, the ashes on the rug um, is a really vivid detail. Um, we get multiple descriptions of the, the pets doing things. The, there's sensory detail all throughout. Where does he place dialogue? Um, this is mostly in the conversation with the vet. Um, what additional dialogue do you think was said that he left out? So this is a really good example where he doesn't take us like all the way through the waiting room. We don't talk to the receptionist. Like the only pieces of dialogue that are there are the ones that are necessary for us to grasp what's going on and the gravity of the situation in the in the uh, veterinarian's words. So the flashback is um, to that movie that he recalled seeing, which allowed him to sort of bring into focus the relationship between him and Neil the cat, um, which ultimately leads to him sort of feeling like he had let the cat down uh, because of how he had to respond to the situation. And so uh, even though the flashback does interrupt the flow of this of the story, uh, it was something he was thinking about at that time, and it serves as a, a parallel, so to speak, for the for him processing, um, what's happening to his cat. So this particular um, excerpt happens to have pretty much all of these things going on in it, but again, um, it's that's not required for a memoir piece. Um, you can structure it any way that makes sense for what it is that uh, you are working on. Now I'd like you to uh, look back at your quick writes from earlier and identify the following. Did you mention any watershed moments? What about everyday meaning? What is the overall theme? And did you use sensory detail or dialogue? So mostly that first one, I want you to look and see, were you leaning more toward uh, big important events or sort of the beauty in the mundane or sometimes the frustrating in the mundane? So just a couple minutes here to do a quick check.
Welcome to the portion of the workshop where you get to write for an extended period of time to a writing prompt. As always, you're welcome to stay here at the laptop, or if you're more comfortable taking your writing materials and finding a more comfortable place, you're welcome to do that. Just meet us back here at the end of the uh, time period, and you'll see a little counter up on the screen that will tell you when we will uh, resume and move to the next session. So enjoy this time. For our first writing prompt, I'd like you to brainstorm some watershed moments or experiences in your life or some everyday encounters that hold important meaning. So for this first uh, chunk of time here, it'll only be a couple of minutes, and the goal is just to get a list. So you're brainstorming, and uh, I'm going to keep this list of bullets up on the screen to help jog your memory and uh, anything that comes to mind that might be worth exploring and writing about, you can go ahead and jot it down. Again, you don't have to flesh it out just yet. Uh, we're just looking for some raw ideas here. For our second writing prompt, now that you have a list to work with, I'd like you to choose one event from prompt one to write about. Brainstorm and write down the following. Some sensory details you remember from that experience. A few memorable lines of dialogue, if it's applicable, not every memoir is going to have spoken dialogue. And what was the meaning you took away from this encounter or experience, as that will become, or could become, the theme of your piece. Now again, we're not drafting just yet, that's going to be step three. This is a, a brainstorming or a pre-writing step where you can generate some potential content and some potential details to support the story that you're going to tell. So again, this can take uh, a myriad of forms I am a bullet point <laughs> lover, so I would uh, make a bulleted list, but uh, again, you can make a mind map, um, you can make a web, you can do whatever is going to just help you get some ideas down on the page. So again, this is just going to run for a couple of minutes, and then we'll take all of these ideas and move into the actual drafting stage for step three.
And for this final step of our writing prompt, you're actually going to start drafting a memoir piece that recounts your experience and the meaning it left you with. Now this is based on the first two steps that we've done so far, so you should have an event and maybe some uh, details that you can potentially incorporate. So try to include a theme that ties the piece together. So this is uh, one of the major things we've been talking about during this workshop is that memoir needs a point. So think about why you're writing it. Now, again, you don't have to come right out and say the point, but there needs to be a theme uh, or an underlying idea or message that you're trying to get across. Uh, some sensory detail. Try for at least three different senses to create a diverse uh, contextual experience. And then optionally, you can include some key lines of dialogue if it's applicable to the story you're telling. And for a challenge, you can try um, doing a flashback. But again, it really depends on the piece whether or not that is going to be appropriate. So you'll have a larger block of time here to write and see if you can come up with a draft or, or a scene of a draft uh, of a memoir experience that was meaningful to you in some way.
You have about one minute of writing time remaining. Okay, for analysis and application, I'd like you to look back at your memoir draft that you were just working on. What did you choose to write about, and did it go the direction you expected? Sometimes when we start writing, we end up in a very different place than we had originally intended. How did you use sensory detail to evoke the world of the memory? And did the meaning or theme change or evolve as you wrote? or did it pretty much stay the same? I'll give you a couple of minutes to reflect on this. If you're in a setting where you can discuss with other writers, that would be great. Otherwise, you can jot down uh, the answers just for your own benefit. Here are your takeaways from this workshop. Memoir is a genre of nonfiction writing driven by memory. Anyone can write memoir. Memoir focuses on a specific topic or theme. It's important to tell events as factually as you can, but it's okay if you don't remember exactly what was said. Just do your best. One of the best ways to learn memoir writing is to read widely in the genre. That's actually true for almost any type of writing that you are trying to master, is uh, get a hold of some quality pieces of writing in that genre. And uh, it's amazing what you can learn just by looking at them uh, and their structure and how they are set up. So here's a list of suggested reading for short memoir pieces. And we're talking like 700 words or less. Um, check out Brevity Magazine. They are a, an online uh, magazine that publishes very short uh, but true 
stories of people's lives, and they they often take a creative approach. Uh, the the writers that are published there. For uh, full length books, try Night by Elie Wiesel, uh, which is a, a memoir of a Holocaust survivor. Pulling Down the Barn by Anne Marie Omen. This is a collection of short memoir pieces that all uh, focus on uh, her upbringing and, and where she grew up. Becoming Unbecoming by Una. The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. A Child Called It by Dave Pelzer and Educated by Tara Westover. Thank you for joining us for this workshop on crafting memoir. Be sure to view the other workshops in this series, which you'll see on the screen in a moment during the credits. The Community Writing Center offers a number of other writing workshops, along with free consultations on any piece of writing. To learn more, visit our website at communitywritingcenter.com. Thank you.